Dr. Minoru Inaba at the center, former state legislator, grown, uh, born and raised in Holua Loa on a coffee farm there. Um, Mr. Inaba was when he started his second career and went into the legislat state legislature and served there for another 10 years. So we want to welcome Mr. Inaba. And um, to his right, we have Mikio Izu, who was born and raised in Honau Now on a coffee farm that his father started there in 1919. Mr. Izu is still on that farm. He's raising coffee there, has been there um, throughout his life, has raised his own family there, and uh, one of our resident coffee experts. Mr. Izu is also going to be giving a demonstration later on on drying and processing coffee in the old style. They're going to be sharing with us some stories that, you know, Cone in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and what it meant to be a coffee farmer in those days and, and what things were like, what people endured and what they rejoiced in and all those little things. So, without any further ado, I also want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Spiegel for videoing. We're videoing this talk story and we're also audio, uh, recording it uh, on an audio tape so that we can make transcriptions and have those in the archive here at the Historical Society. Okay. And we're going to just be real informal here this morning. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions. They'll, uh, you know, give us some, some good stories. And then uh, the second half will, you know, anybody can jump in. And if you have questions of your own that you'd like to ask, then that'll be the time to do it. I'd like to start just by, uh, with Mr. Inaba. Mr. Inaba, can you tell folks just a little bit about yourself and uh, what it was like to be up in Kululaloa in the, the 19-teens as a child? Well, I was born... <coughs> it's on. I was born in Kululaloa, that's in North Kona, and I'm from a family of uh, nine children two girls and seven boys. We had a coffee farm, nine-acre coffee farm, when I grew up. And uh, much of the labor on the farm was done by the, our parents and the children. I recall picking coffee from early in the morning until late in the afternoon. And after picking the days uh, for the day, uh, hauling the coffee up the trail to my home where we ground our coffee uh, on a donkey and uh, we used to load three bags of coffee on a donkey and coming up the trail on a rainy day many times the donkey would slip and would fall and uh, as a youngster I remember crying many times trying to reload the donkey now we le I learned something you know, try to get the donkey up after it fell was a problem. But I learned that uh, I, by lighting a piece of paper and putting it under his tail, <laughs> it would jump up. So that's what I used to do. Now, after coming home, we had to grind the coffee by hand. Today, uh, today it's all mechanized. But in those days, there was no uh, engine that is gasoline engine engine so we had to hand grind it and it was quite a job then after grinding the coffee we had to wash it in a big trough and uh, step on it and in that way we washed the coffee then we put it all up took it over the sea uh, get the water out and then put it on the coffee platform uh, on the platform in the morning we had to spread the coffee out on a platform and in the afternoon we had to push it back up at the front of the uh, top of the platform and cover with galvanized iron to so that it won't get caught in the rain then in about oh i would say the late 20s somebody thought of uh, using a roof over the uh, coffee platform on rails and uh, in the morning just push the uh, uh, covering so that you 
Medina. You have to scrape the coffee every morning and in the afternoon. And uh, in the afternoon, of course, you push the, uh, plat uh, the roof over the platform. And the platform no normally was the ceiling of the house. So it served two purposes. I remember in 1929, I had a friend from Honolulu uh, visit us in Kona, and I took him on a tour of the district. And uh, he told me, say, you know, I thought I saw a house moving. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. I knew what it was, but I didn't say anything. I wanted him to guess a little while. Then, say, is something wrong with me? I, 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 I really saw a house moving. So after the, uh, in the afternoon, I told him, no, it's a coffee platform that is the house. So, uh, that saved quite a bit of labor. <coughs> so, Mr. Inaba, yes. before, before there was the rolling um, roof of Ashidana, um, you folks, didn't you, did you dry it on uh, gunny sacks? Was it laid out on the ground? Or? Yes, some of the uh, people who didn't have enough space on the Hoshidana, that is the plat drying platform, used gunny sacks and dried it out on the porch. I remember as a youngster, one of the stores used to dry the coffee on the gunny sack. And then in the afternoon, they roll it up, bring it up, and leave it on the porch. And we as youngsters used to go try, uh, roam around the village. And uh, at night, we'd huddle ourselves in the coffee because it was warm. Yes, so they, some of them used the uh, gunny sack to sewed the gunny sacks together and used this as a drawing. Mr. Izu, can you can you tell us now a little bit about what um, things were like in Honan now when you were you were growing up a little bit later than, than Mr. Inaba? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> 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 when he graduated high school, I was just born. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, people started about 3.30 in the morning. You see, my neighbor, they used to have a farm separate. They have one, where they live, they had a farm, but they had another one separate. And they used to bring the coffee, and they used to pop and wash it. So they started real early in the morning, so they can, you know, travel to the next uh, hill. And traveling was either by foot or by donkey. And of course the hauling was all by the, done by donkey. And uh, I don't know, I haven't lighted any fire under the donkeys if we ran, but then, you know, when I first started packing a coffee on a donkey, you know the saddle there, there's the saddle out there. Okay, you gotta put the coffee on, flip the rope over, run on the other side and get the other one, you see. But the first time I did, when I went on the other side, hey, where's the coffee? <laughs> the coffee is hanging under the belly. <laughs> it was, you know, one side, you know. So after that, we, what I used to do was I cut a coffee stump about this long for a piece of lumber. After I put a rope on, I used to prop the coffee out so I can move around. And with these donkeys, they're really bad. They're bad guys, you know. <laughs> if you lead them, Especially down here, they trot and they bite. Yeah, these donkeys, they're really bad. But when, so what you used to do, up the hill, even up the hill, you gotta follow. When you follow, you gotta watch, they, they, they gas the buggers, you see. <laughs> so you gotta keep good distance. <laughs> anyway, donkeys were hard, and that's the only way, you know. No, just for eating grass. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's how transportation, the only movement of the coffee was. And like Mr. Enaba said, when, during, when times, you know, when rainy season, it's very slippery. And it's, like he went uphill, I went came downhill. And uh, oh, the donkey tried to brace themselves in very slow, very, very slow. Well, I wanted to ask. I know we have everyone here was in school before um, coffee schedule was introduced. What did families do when the harvest happened and they needed the kids home to pick? Um, did, were you folks, um, did you miss school because of that or maybe Mr. Izu? Could... No, uh, I really don't remember too well before that because uh, I think when I was just about started school, the coffee schedule went into effect. That would be, we go to school until late August. And our vacation will stop in September. Uh, and school will open a uh, few days before Thanksgiving. <coughs> so that, we used to call a coffee schedule. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess it was all right. <laughs> until some people came and thought that wasn't the best idea. So <laughs> we, we changed it families that really needed their children to help. <coughs> Some of them were excused for a few days harvesting our coffee at home. Then of course in 1938, the coffee schedule came in where uh, the children were kept home and uh, picked, helped pick the uh, family's coffee. Did you folks hire, um, or did you have enough kids in the family to do your whole harvest, or were you um, hiring additional pickers? Well, I don't remember hiring any, because seven in the family, not too bad. You know, and uh, like I said, everybody would come out. We forgot what Sunday was. <laughs> yeah. Nobody observed Sunday, or maybe the only day off you got was uh, because the Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's came during the peak of the harvest season, the only day my parents would rest would be on New Year's Day. Other than that, no. New Year's Day was a big um, occasion for the coffee family. Uh, can you describe how you folks might have celebrated New Year's Day? Well, because uh, when I was going to school, most of the farmers were Japanese. And, you know, for Japanese New Year's, uh, that's such a big day. Uh, nothing special. All we know is uh, the day before, we used to 
don't know, mochi and uh, and uh, maybe the, they will kill a couple of chickens and have uh, something like that's about all. It's nothing fancy. Mr. Nava? Yeah, New Year's, as uh, Mickey said, was a day of celebration for the among the Japanese people. <coughs> and usually a day or two before New Year's, they would pound mochi, you know, that's a rice cake. And the community or the neighbors would get together on a rotation basis. Maybe one year at my home, the next year at another person's home, and used to pound the mochi. And then on New Year's, it was traditional that they have uh, specific kinds of food, like in uh, American way, Thanksgiving, you have your turkey and so on. Uh, the Japanese celebrated New Year, so what the community used to do when I was a youngster was go from house to house to express good year's greetings. And uh, by the time afternoon came, most of us were goody well lit up. <laughs> and uh, I remember sleeping on the roadside <laughs> in the after, late in the afternoon. So the community was a very close-knit community. And uh, I remember when Coffee Blossom was in full bloom, they'd have what they call Hana Matsuda, that is, observing the blossoms. And uh, they'd here again, they would rotate. This year, my family would have dinner or refreshments, and the community would come to look at the blossoms. And uh, as you know, coffee blossoms are very pretty when it's in full bloom. And the following year, the next neighbor would uh, have the take care of the uh, entertainment. And in that way, they used to rotate the uh, viewing of the coffee blossoms. And uh, you know, uh, in the early days, there were very few financial institutions where farmers would go to for loans. So what they used to do was the farmers used to get together and form a tanomoshi. That is a sort of a cop where every month each one will put in, let's say, $10 or $25, whatever. They decide on that, the group will get together and decide on that. And every month somebody would bid for the amount that's collected for that month. And in that way, for instance, if a person needed the money in January, he'd bid. Maybe the next person would bid too, but whoever bid the highest would get the lump sum. And of course, he had to continue paying. Okay, now, before the Hokidana was um, invented, folks, um, were they all making parchment, or were they sending this cherry to um, uh, Captain Cook or Amphac? Each family ground its own coffee before the corporates came in. That is, each farmer would have its own platform, its own grinding unit, and would grind its own coffee and dry its own coffee. Now your family was so there were there were basically two major coffee companies in Kona between the turn of the century and the mid 1950s, and that was Captain Cook Coffee Company, which was located the mill was located down in Nakoko Road, going toward Kalamazoo Bay, and then American Factors, its uh, milling operation. So generally farmers were associated with one company or the other, is that correct? Yes, indirectly. Uh, most of the farmers were uh, associated with the merchants in their neighborhood. And the merchants in return got credit from the American people that I'm talking about, the whole lawyer. The merchants would get credit from American factors, the wholesalers. And uh, their credit would last over the year. So with the farmer, the farmer would go to buy merchandise from the store, general merchandise store. And uh, at the end of the year, the coffee season, they would pay a sto uh, store in uh, with, with their coffee. And the merchant would in turn turn the coffee over to the uh, to American factories. Of course, in between they'd pay cash, but whenever they didn't have cash, they'd pay in, uh, what you call coffee. And, uh, I remember 
some of the farmers who needed cash badly would sneak their coffee instead of giving it to the store or American factors would sneak their coffee out and sell it to some other outfit. And uh, American factors had a man, I still remember, his name was Mr. Takeda. He used to patrol the district at night and during the day to see which farmers would sneak their coffee out. You know, you know the farmers needed the cash, so instead of doing it close to the store, or the captain uh, to the American factors, they'd sell it to somebody else for cash. Mr. Izu, was your, your family was associated with Captain Cook? Did they take the carry down there or parchment? No, uh, we, uh, Mr. Brian owned coffee. <laughs> when you listen to the stories of the old people, you don't sell coffee to these people, you get nothing. They won't even let you bring a coffee down, they won't even let you want to look at a scale, you know, then close the door, so he said no. Uh, going back to what Mr. Inaba said, you know, you deal with the merchants. And I remember my mother used to send me to the store and then she used to bring this little time book, you know. And uh, if I buy uh, maybe a package, a pound of shrimp, you put shrimp. And then, like I said, like I said, we never did pay in every month. We was usually paid at the end of the year with coffee. Bad years, you're bad. The man said, you know, you owe your life to the company store. And I think a lot of people were uh, in that situation. I remember MFAC, uh, when the situation got real bad, uh, MFAC wrote off all the debts. But now when I... Well, they didn't just do that benevolently. You guys had to lobby for that. And See, I, I really don't right? know about you know, when I look back, when I look back, I think the stores made all the money because they they, they forgave their debts, but the merchants didn't forgive ours. <laughs> so, man, I think the merchants got ahead. So, when hit. American Factors and Captain Cook forgave the debt... I don't know about Captain Cook. Yes, the uh, farmers and the merchants formed a coalition, and they sent representatives, as I recall to American Factors. At that time, the manager of American Factors was Mr. Childs. And the farmers believed or thought that American Factors made enough money out of them so they would ask for the cancellation of their debts or uh, cut down, discount their debts. And that's how this thing right. came To about. back up a little bit, the debt, there was a large debt that was accumulated by farmers because during the 1920s there was a, there was a boom in coffee. Mm -hmm. Prices went up. And when prices went up, people invested in things that they might not normally have invested in, new buildings, new houses, new uh, milling equipment that they might not have invested in because, you know, if the times weren't as good. And then, of course, the, the history of coffee is booms and busts. And right after that, there was a bust, and people went really far into debt. So they were dealing with a, a huge debt, and one that they probably never would have gotten out of if they hadn't been able I remember uh, most of the farmers, except for uh, some farmers living up Captain Cook, Captain Cook Coffee Company at that time had their own store, so they went there. But with us, there were a lot of small little stores, so uh, we dealt with them. So how much debt factors or uh, road off, we really don't know. I don't think the farmers really know. Well, obviously, this huge debt and the series of booms and busts that, that farmers did um, go through between the turn of the century and into the 40s really sowed the, the seeds of, um, or germinated the seeds for the, the co-ops to rise up. And I know Mr. Izu was very um, involved in the uh, organization of Sunset Cooperative, which was one of the first um, cooperatives um, in South Kona. And could you tell us a little bit about how that all came about? <coughs> well, because of the difficult times, the farmers thought, yeah, maybe if we can get together, we might come out a little better. 
that when they started talking about forming a co-op, uh, there were different co-ops. It was more uh, organized by the manager themselves. You know, they own the meal, they own everything. Uh, they appointed themselves manager. They set their wages, so... Uh, Would this have been an independent processor before the, before the co-op? You're talking about, say, someone like Kudo who had a, his own processing company? Right, and then he, when, we, uh, when he first started the uh, Sunset Coffee Co-op, uh, he sort of got, got us together and we organized, you know, organized. And there were other, like, the uh, Pacific Coffee Co-op and uh, the other mill owners got together and organized that. Because like the, uh, with the Sunset Coffee Co-op, after we started going, we talked about uh, quality control. And we thought that instead of each farmer doing his own way of processing, uh, we got together and said, gee, how's about we started a centralized processing where all the farmers deliver the coffee one place and one method of uh, processing. So that's when we bought the uh, uh, Captain Cook coffee mill. That's the one down up before. Uh, honestly, it didn't, just didn't work out. The reason why it didn't work out, I think, was uh, the fault of, say, one of them was me. We just didn't quite uh, tell the farmers what a co-op really was. To the farmers, they thought the co-op was somebody who will buy your coffee and sell. So sometimes the payment got slow because the co-op will process your coffee, but you know, sometimes market becomes slow and you know it's hard to sell. But then the farmers wanted to get paid. On the other hand, when the farmers bought the fertilizer through the co-op, they have to pay in 30 days. So now they're all confused. You know, how come when you, you buy from me, you don't pay me, but when I buy from you, I gotta pay. But this is, I think, I would take the blame too. As one of the original directors, we did not explain to the farmers what a co-op really was. That a co-op was your organization until the coffee is sold, that's your coffee, the co-op will just do the transaction for you. And uh, I think this is one of the reasons why the co-ops are very weak today. And then we have the individual millers come in. I remember when they purchased their uh, coffee mill, the other guys say, why, why pay for a mill? Sell to me, you don't have to pay for mill. You already got the mill. But they didn't realize they got the mill, but they don't own it. And again, that was, I, I admit, it was my fault. But the co-ops did dominate, um, you know, between the 1950s and until really late 70s, early 80s. Right, we so did, but very slowly the farmers started moving out. And without uh, the volume of production, cost of operation became high. So the return to the farmers became less. Whereas the other guys, there was no uh, investment on uh, you know, physical facilities. So the return to them was better. But today, we are the, the uh, original Sunset Coffee Corp. It's the only surviving corp who has the own physical facility. We own the land, we own the building and everything. And this is what we was we should have told them at the very beginning when you organize the co-op that this is how it's going to end up. But then a lot of farmers move out. We have indivi uh, independent processes come in, you know, and pay more. And today they are asking why uh, the individual processes able to pay more than a co-op, when a co-op is a non-profit organization but cannot pay more. Well, one thing is the cost, the overhead cost, I operate such a big meal like that. So, naturally, it's your own thing for you. Net returns becomes a little less than the other guy. And also, you cannot say, uh, 
just to get a farmer to move in with you, you can just kind of pay more than the other guy, uh, more than the other. You pay to the other farmer. With a pork, you gotta pay everybody the same. But if you, have, if you own the processing plant, you can do anything. And I think this is the problem. The way we pull, okay, you go on the other end, hold that end. Okay, so when it starts raining, you gotta run because you push it, push it in the center. Come on, in the center. Okay, ready to see? This way. And then, okay, flip it over. There. That's how we should do it. Okay, in the morning, we take it out, and again, we gotta do this. Okay, grab this yeah, side. Already you can leave on the table. Yeah, and then we just do it. Okay. Grab that. You, what do, what you wanna try? You, grab that. Let him rake it. You can't do that. Put everything down. That's the way. See, now this yeah. here, I know they can find here and put this together. And you know, uh, even this, we didn't have enough area. So, a lot of times, what a farmer used to do in the living room, they didn't have carpets, they had straw mats. So they roll up the straw mat and they put water around your living room and they should put coffee this thick. Because we cannot drag them because they get moldy. You know, so this is how they used to do. And uh, some people used to put this bag on a, underneath the house. I wanted to make, <laughs> I wanted to make one on announcement. The she said passion. A big passion for flowers. Can you eat it? So I cannot make this. Uh, my neighbor has this. What, what is that? This is crumb root. C R U M root. Uh, crumb root. The Oriental use this uh, uh, grating and then uh, uh, after grating, you put in the water and then uh, you sink that uh, ingredient uh, in the water. And you throw away the water then there will be a fine uh, uh, particle just like uh, uh, flour. Ah, like and sago. Oh, yeah. this is konyaku. Yeah. This is konyaku? Yeah. Oh, oh what? I am so busy talking. Yeah. <laughs> we talk to him too much, so you gotta come. Yeah. 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 Yeah.